podcast. It's Wild Ginger Running. I'm Claire Maxted and tonight I'm delighted to say that I am joined by Tim Pickett who is an endurance coach and a sports physio and he's here to ask or answer all of our injury questions tonight. So hi Tim, how are you doing? All good, thanks for having me along. Good to catch up with you again. Brilliant. Yes, Tim was at our Bridgedale shoot. You know, I did the Bridgedale shoot um, a couple of months ago now. So just before all of the lockdown kind of thing happened um, and we were out there on Loughrigg Fell above Ambleside. Um, so how has the lockdown been going for you then, Tim? What's it been like? Uh, well, I've got my two-year-old banging on the, the door trying to get in just at the moment. So, yeah. <laughs> Quite, uh, juggle, um, so, hi Tim, how are you doing? All uh, oh, good, thanks for having me along. Good to catch up with you again. <laughs> oh, is that me on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just have to mute it because um, there's like about a 30 second delay. <laughs> yeah, I've just realised I've got that running in the background. Apologies about that. No, try, sometimes yeah. I do that too. <laughs> this, this is live. This proves that it's really live, doesn't it? <laughs> proves that uh, it's live. Yeah. Right. And, and, as per the BBC interview that everyone remembers, I've now got my child trying oh, to come in. Hello. <laughs> no, you can't play on the piano. <laughs> Do they normally start off like this, Claire? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, my wife's now coming to uh, take the child away. To extract um, their child. Oh, well, it was funny. We did a pub quiz on Friday, and the guy had a call halfway through. It was um, Nigel from Manx Mountain Marathon. He came to do a round of the quiz, and uh, he had a call halfway through from the delivery company for his mum's groceries. So he had to take it because he was like, I, I just ha I have to take this call. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, so, it's totally informal. Everybody's really free and easy. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, lots of people saying hi. But yeah, ha like, how's it been for you during lockdown? Uh, like, what, yeah, so what it's kind of stuff? Fun for you because um, yeah, so my background is I'm a physiotherapist, um, but most of my time now is I'm a university lecturer. So I teach on the postgraduate program at Salford, um, trauma and orthopedics. And a lot of my work I actually do from home anyway. So there's a lot of online teaching um, because my students are mostly working full time in the NHS themselves. So for my working environment, it hasn't really changed. Um, and then the other sort of big part of my, my job role is, is, as you mentioned there, coaching. So sort of endurance runners, triathletes, mountain athletes, that type of thing. Um, and I do that via training peaks. So again, it's all online. So my kind of working day to day hasn't changed massively. Um, I'm not going to the clinic and, and doing the small amount of clinical work I was doing. But apart from that, it's pretty much kind of normal. Um, it's just the fact that we're now having to homeschool and um, juggle everything else so my wife she's a midwife so she's working in the hospital so I'm just having to then juggle everything else in between um, which is the same as everybody's dealing with isn't it um, but I'm lucky that I live right on the edge of the town like literally if you look over there it's sheep and then that's it oh lovely so you kind of getting out and about I'm, I'm very very fortunate that um, we can literally just step out of our door and we're walking across fields um, yeah. and you know socially isolated um, so that's not too bad really I saw in your the skipping film that you did for me very kindly for this Monday's film um, everybody if you haven't seen me attempting to skip in this Monday's film um, instructed by Tim here then uh, do give it a watch I'll put a link in the film description below but Tim was advising us on skipping um, and I could see that the field behind you was just full of sheep and I thought oh that's a lovely back garden to just back onto in the middle of yeah. nowhere it looks great yeah. um, and so the first question we have is about skipping Skipping, um, first of yeah. all, but I just want to read out a few um, a few nice comments um, for every from everybody on the on the live. We've got 20 people watching. Um, it sometimes goes up to about 40 live, and then oh, it's in its thousands later. Um, so uh, jo John Gardner is here, and he says this is going to be great. Seb says, ah, just in time. Hi everyone. Yeah. Uh, just to give you a sense of um, people who's watching, Guy Greatrex is here as well. Um, Conrad Anderson says hello. Just checking in for a bit. Um, and then Colin Thompson, um, he's he's already um, in in with the, the questions here. He says hi, hoping for good ankle tips because his was badly injured uh, three years ago by an okay. os osteopath wrenched it. Oh my goodness! Okay. So so yeah, we are going to come on to ankle tips in a bit as well, aren't we, Tim? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, should we go for the first question then, which is from Matthew Coates, um, oh. and it's about skipping. 
So he's been trying to learn to skip for the last two or three weeks, um, mm -hmm. trying to do it boxer style. He says he's not a boxer. Yep. He smashed yep. the handles of one skipping rope in frustration um, when he threw it on the floor. Please, can yep. you ask him, what is the best length of rope um, yeah. in relation to your height? Like, what, what do you do? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. If the, if the rope is too long, then you're going to catch it on the ground, which is then going to then maybe trip you up. Obviously, if it's too short, you're going to keep hitting yourself over the back of the head or you're going to catch your toes, things like that. Um, so lengthwise, you can use a very rough guide, which is if you get your skipping rope, um, I should have brought it in, but if you hold on to the handles, okay, you could demonstrate, couldn't you? <laughs> I'll demonstrate. <laughs> Stand um, with one foot on the skipping rope in the middle. Oh, okay. Take the handles. The handles should roughly come up to your armpit. So oh. come on, let's, let's give us a, a live demo. Okay, live demo coming up here. I might have to just remove that. his question from the screen here. Oh, all my um. Oh no, they're really too short. So they're just they're just maybe <laughs> oh, little. Oh, yeah. Short. I just um, need to put my headphones. I need to put my headphones back in to hear you. I think that's too short. That's why I was rubbish at skipping in that film. Awesome. Obviously. That was why you were finding it a little bit tricky at times. Yeah, uh, well, it was. It's a kid's skipping rope and it, it came and I didn't really realise it was a kid's skipping rope but the packaging was quite clear that it should go in a party bag. So <laughs> I think yeah. it's a kid's. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so I need to get a longer a little skipping bit more, rope. more um, kind of specific there. So roughly, they come in, um, if we're going sort of old school, um, what sort of seven foot, eight foot, nine foot, ten foot length skipping ropes. Um, so if you're quite short like me, um, then so if you're shorter than four foot nine they say you, you're going for about a seven foot skipping rope between about four nine and five three it's going to be about an eight foot skipping rope uh if we go metric that's about i've, I've ske um, sketched down the numbers here 244 centimeters um five four to five eight you're looking at about a nine foot skipping rope so that's 274 centimeters if you're a bit taller five eight to um sort of six six then you're looking at about a 10 foot skipping rope. So that's about 305 centimetres. Um, and if you're taller than 6'6", six, six, then you're looking at um, an 11 foot uh, or 335 centimetre skipping rope. Um, the longer ones, again, is for when you're doing tricks, you know, like two people skipping, three mm -hmm. people, so on and so forth. Oh, yeah, like you used to do at Brownies. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All the playground stuff. Yeah. Uh, so those are the kind of rough guides there. Um, so sort of summary, you know, the most people are going to be sitting in that sort of four nine five three. So you're looking at about an eight foot one. Like I say, five four to five eight is about a nine foot rope, and a five eight to six six is about a ten foot rope. Um, but then you've got the choice of materials. So the type of rope you're choosing will determine obviously the speed of how quickly it goes through the air. So yeah, you, your chat there mentioned about sort of trying to do a boxer styling. So, you know, things like double um, double loops per jump. And oh, okay, things. really fast. So you need something that's gonna travel fast, which is usually you talk about like a leather um, rope, which is good, it'll, it'll travel fast, but if it hits you, it's gonna hurt. Oh, yeah, that's gonna burn, isn't it? <laughs> so it's kind of maybe going for a, um, maybe more of a sort of plastic material which isn't going to travel maybe quite so fast when you're getting going so when you do get it wrong and, and catch yourself it doesn't hurt quite so much um, but then as I mentioned in that video is if you don't have a skipping rope it doesn't really matter because it's the the principles of that that reactivity off the ground that um, having that very short ground contact time which is part of what we call plyometric training so that's sort of bouncing, skipping, and really trying to get that spring in your step. So you could literally just pretend you've got a skipping rope and bounce up and down. So if you do find that you, you, you're struggling with it, that you're not getting the, the rhythm, uh, you're not getting the bounce, um, maybe you're dragging your toes and you keep catching um, the rope on your toes, then maybe just practice literally just bouncing on the spot yeah so you can just jump just you it's not about it's not about the skipping rope it's just it's about the jumping the skipping rope is coordination and timing and a bit of skill um but what we're looking for as as runners really is that spring off the ground so you could literally just be bouncing 
And the key thing is to make it a bounce, not a jump. And that's that real snap off the ground, not land, jump off, land, uh -huh. jump off. It's that Doing trying to really, really snap it off the ground there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, when you jump off the ground, is you try and pull the toes up as you're in the air. So you're not leaving your toes hanging for that rope to then catch your toes. Mm -hmm. It's jumping off and you actively pull those toes up. And then as you're coming down, you almost start to push down into the ground before you even get there. And it's a sort of term that gets called sort of preactive, sort of preactivating the, those muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so practice just doing that. And um, I think again in that video, I did do a little bit of a, um, a zoom in on that sort of ankle action of trying to really pull those toes up. Um, or again, I've got other um, videos on my YouTube channel sort of highlighting that sort of ankle, uh, the ankle ankling running drills, which again, training that same idea of picking those toes up and not being lazy with your toes. Um, and the other thing then is getting that rhythm, which is where the skipping rope's coming in because it's getting you to go at a certain rhythm. So if you're finding that you're not bouncing maybe in the, in the best rhythm, then get a metronome. Um, so you can just download, I'll see whether this will come across on the camera. Um, so I just use a, because I've got the zoom one, it's possibly not going to come up on that. No, maybe do a link. Um, but you could do a, uh, let's do a, so set it at 120 beats a minute and just jump on the beat and then try and add the, the skipping rope into it. Cool. And once you get that, then it's kind of trying to get obviously a bit quicker. So, you know, it might be kind of turning up to 140 beats a minute. Um, and that's actually what, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a bit of a rave. Um, and that's actually what that um, research paper that is, uh, it was published online just the other week, which is what led me to do that piece for you. Um, it's actually ahead of print, so it hasn't actually come out in the journal just yet. But that's what they did. They started people off at 120 beats a minute. And then once their athletes got used to it, they then lifted up to 140 beats a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and this will maybe come on to some of the stuff we can talk about uh, a bit later on in our call regarding cadence and rhythm there. So that's another reason for why we maybe incorporate the skipping is just to train ourselves to maybe bounce off the ground just that little bit quicker rather than being big, heavy footed. Yes, yeah, that's brilliant. And um, so I will link up to Tim's film about the skipping and my not so successful film about the skipping um, in the description below. So check that out, everyone. Um, and just uh, before we move on from the skipping to the Achilles side of things, um, Guy Greatorex wanted to ask a question about barefoot skipping. So he <laughs> says, um, what are the pros and cons of barefoot skipping? Is that a good way to strengthen your feet and tendons and ankles, maybe? Yes, so pros and cons. So barefoot work, whether that's skipping or doing running drills uh, or even barefoot running is useful at strengthening your feet. Um, however, you've got to be careful. Do you have the tissue capacity, the strength within your tissues to take those kind of loads? Um, how much time do you spend barefoot day to day. Um, have you done a lot of, you know, barefoot running or, or running drills barefoot? And if the answer to any of those is no, then you're going to have to be very, very careful. Um, and of course, again, it's being very careful about the surface that you're doing it on. So can you jump barefoot on, you know, hard concrete? Yes. But only if you have the capacity in your tissues to take that kind of force. Um, so I, if you're wanting to incorporate some barefoot work into your training, it is very good at, at strengthening those small muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the bones of your foot. But you need to do it very, very slowly, build up very, very gradually. Um, we're talking months and, and years gradually to build that up. Um, I'd probably start off on um, a softer surface. so. Maybe doing on a you know well cut lawn, grass, things like that. 
Uh, and obviously the common sense things of making sure that you're not jumping on top of, you know, small rocks or broken bits of glass and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, doing, you know, barefoot running drills, um, barefoot skipping, it can be useful. But the caveat is always going to be start off very slow um, and just little, little bits. It might be as, as little as, you know, it might be kind of 20 seconds, 30 seconds maximum. And you leave it at that. That might be it for day one. And then on day three, you do another 30 seconds. It could be as little as that and gradually layer that loading um, through your tissues. Yeah. And well, is, it even, is it even useful to do barefoot skipping? I mean, if you're always going to run in shoes, uh, surely is it more beneficial to just do the skipping in the same shoes that you would normally trail run in? It's a very valid point um, that... And this comes back to a little bit of our debate regarding barefoot running versus shod running um, and where the evidence lies. So you can run barefoot, you will run faster with a little bit of cushioning. Um, again, I've gone off slight tangents, but um, what the research has shown regarding the amount of cushioning that you uh, will perform best in is when you put those shoes on, are they comfortable, whether they're minimal or maximal? So are you a hocker versus a you know more minimalist um, running shoe? The ones that feel most, most comfortable to you probably work for you. Um, if they don't feel comfortable, don't force it. So if you like doing barefoot work, um, you feel very comfortable doing some barefoot running drills and barefoot skipping, um, you run in more minimalist shoes, then yeah, incorporating that foot strength by doing some barefoot skipping or barefoot drills is maybe worth including, as long as you're being careful about how much you load and how quickly you load it. If you're somebody who prefers that more maximal cushioned shoe, if you then try and add in a load of barefoot work, you probably don't have those intrinsic muscles, those small muscles in your foot, strengthened and trained up to take that kind of impact force. Now that's not to say that it wouldn't be worth including a little bit into the, your training. Um, and this period that we're in right now is maybe not a bad time to do that because for most of us, our running volume has gone down and we can incorporate more drills and skills into our training. Um, so that's where maybe exploring some of this, if you've got a, a garden, you can do a few little drills in. And it might be just barefoot, you know, jogging those 5, 10, 20 metres, depending on how big your garden is, and just starting to build that up. Yeah, it really is the ideal time to sort of get into any of these alternative things, which we should be doing all the time anyway, isn't it? <laughs> mm. um, okay, well, that's really good advice that about the skipping. Advice? Yeah, no, that's really, really good. Thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, we have a couple of questions about the Achilles. So I'll, I'll just read a couple of those out because I okay. suppose barefoot skipping is kind of related to the Achilles in that you might strain it by doing some barefoot skipping. Um, yeah. So Paul, oh, oh no, I'll read, uh, uh, yeah, Philip Haddock says, I did a 26 mile run about a month ago and did some damage to my Achilles tendon. I can run on it for about six miles and, and walk on it. Um, what can he do to help heal it better? And then in a similar line, we've got John Gardner saying, what are some of the signs of a, a patient who is healing a t Achilles tendon strain can use to know that they are doing just the right amount and type of activity to promote healing. So um, that's two kind of a little bit different questions there. Um, one's about uh, helping to heal it quickly and the yeah. other one is about how do you know if you're doing the right thing to promote healing, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> So I think probably answer the second one as we work through the first one. Okay. Um, so the first thing we've got to do is work out, well, why has this happened in the first place? So you mentioned a 26-mile run, um, was it a couple of weeks ago? A month ago. A month ago. So the question is, well, what was happening two and maybe three months ago? Because unless it's that you've, you know, fallen off a cliff and or fallen off a ladder and you've, you've, 
overstretched it in that one instance. Um, you know, was that 26 mile run um, the sole reason for why this Achilles has started hurting? Um, and the chances are it's that you've overloaded probably more gradually. So it's looking at what was happening in the two weeks usually prior to this, sometimes looking further back than that. So was that 26 mile run two, three times more than your usual long run? And have you just overloaded because you didn't have the capacity from those previous weeks? So it's looking at your chronic fitness versus your acute fitness. Um, or is it that you've suddenly ramped up over a period of you know, one, two weeks, and then you suddenly, the Achilles has just said, no, I've had enough now, thank you very much, I need some time out. Um, because you haven't given it a slow enough build for that tissue to adapt um, and get stronger for the loads being placed upon it. Um, there's a, a, a good concept that we use in, in physio sports medicine, um, DYES envelope of function, uh, D-Y-E-S, I think you pronounce it. Um, so it's thinking about how much is, is your tissue, how much are your tissues able to take normally? So I think your chat mentioned that you can now do sort of six mile runs, you can walk on it and it's okay. But if you try to do a 26 mile run, you'll be back to almost square one again. So you think about the kind of first level of that function is, you know, I can do six mile runs, I can, you know, go walking for an hour or two, I can walk up and down the stairs, it's fine. But if I try and do a 10 or a 15 or 20 mile run, it's pushing me beyond my capacity to cope. And what we've got to do is push that envelope up here so that 15, 20 miles, 26 miles isn't a problem. So it's what do we need to do to move that up to there? So then it's working out, well, what were the limitations of that tissue? Why has it um, become painful? So is it that, um, quite simply, the training just ramps up too quickly? Okay, training error. And that's usually where these things come from. Most of these injuries are a training error. So do we just need to go back and six mile runs are pain free? Good let's work on six mile runs and just get consistent training at six mile runs and then we can start to lift it a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. You'll have heard about the kind of 10% rule, you know, only increase your training by 10% a week. Um, it's a good guide. So some people can increase by 20%, some people can only increase by 5% or less. Um, but it's a good rough guide to maybe start with. But listen to your body, start to maybe lift up that running and gradually build it up that way. But you can then also look at the different components of um, the calf strength and the Achilles strength. Um, is it that there just wasn't the endurance capacity in that tissue? So that's why maybe five, six mile runs are okay, but pushing it longer than that didn't really have the endurance in the tissues got fatigued, couldn't cope with the loads, and that's where the, um, the injuries come from. So when we're looking at maybe testing calf and Achilles endurance, we're doing the classic heel raises on a step. So body weight, toes on, on your step, slowly drop the heel down, right up onto tiptoes, and you're doing one of those per second. So again, you could get your old metronome out on your phone and doing one heel raise, per second and you're seeing how many can I really do. Um, there was a, a good study by um, Herbert and Loza a couple of years back um, and they got a baseline benchmark for non-injured people um, and what should you be able to do. So that's quite a useful thing to kind of benchmark yourself against. So um, I don't know how old your, your chat pool was but um, the sort of um, younger males, so kind of their study was 20 to 29, you should be able to do a single leg heel raise 37 times before getting tired. Wow, <laughs> I think I could do 10. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more on the right than the left as well. The left is, is pants, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry we to say. We did have chat about this, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. um, so again, that's where you then need to almost kind of 
get a bit of a benchmark um, every so often. So the same way that we like to test ourselves with um, races, uh, maybe you go and do your local park run and you push yourself you know, once a month to see where you're at. Within our training, we should also be having regular tests. So I set my athletes um, both fitness tests in the usual sense, but also strength and capacity tests. Um, so yeah, that, that range that Herbert Loza put out was, as I said there, the kind of young, the younger age groups, that's sort of 37 down to um, 30 for women. Um, if, our, if we're sort of 30 to 39, it starts to drop down to about sort of 32 for men, 27 for women, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, 60 to 69 is sort of 19 for men uh, and same for women. Um, and then, you know, if you've got any much older listeners, then again, it might be um, a little bit less again. For our elite athletes, if they're doing less than 50 per leg, then we're asking questions of them. Oh. So it's that difference between are you a recreational athlete or are you an elite athlete? Oh, I'm that, definitely an elite athlete. 100 percent. Seen the It's phenomenal. I'm, um, I'm often the first ginger person in races. There you go. <laughs> um, but this all comes down to, I guess, my next point is: well, what le- what amount of force are you putting through your tissues? So if you're just jogging along nice and nice and smoothly, nice and gently, then the amount of force going through your lower leg, through the Achilles, um, it might be um, maybe two times your body weight. Um, if you're running at a, at a good at a good pace, it might be um, up to three times your body weight. If you're sprinting, it could be five times your body weight or more. So that brings on to the next point of, do you have that structural integrity in your your tendons to take that amount of force, the gravity, that impact, and the muscles are pulling on that tendon? So if you cannot stand on, on tiptoes on one leg with whatever your body weight is, and again, and maybe even again, on your shoulders, well, what's happening at that Achilles and in that calf every time your foot hits the ground and so to find that out you might need to go and see a physio <laughs> yeah we just it, well it's difficult at the moment with respect to getting into gyms yeah. <laughs> um, but what you could be doing is just thinking right well i i weigh um 60 70 80 kilograms okay get a rucksack get your scales out fill that rucksack with bottles of water or books or whatever weight you can use Get that on your shoulders and then stand on the bottom step of your stairs on your tiptoes, shift your weight onto one leg, and can you hold it? Mm, yes, and uh, I know what you mean. I was trying to do an arabesque where you lean forward with a weight in your hands, um, yes. and on my left leg, I just kept like falling over very slowly to one side or the other. So yeah. eventually, I had to just do it without the weight. Whereas okay. on my right foot, I could definitely do it with the right weight. So yeah, I think we've all got to go away and do some calf raises, haven't we? <laughs> crazy. Well, I mean, that probably comes on to one of your other questions a bit later on tonight um, regarding sort of balance and proprioception. Um, but you know, even just using you know a rucksack or um, you know, if you haven't got a rucksack, if you've got a suitcase, anything really that you can. You don't have to use anything fancy. So even just holding a couple of suitcases in your hands and then going up onto tiptoes, can you take that kind of weight and that kind of load through through your feet? And if you're finding it's hard, then you've got to ask the question, well, what is happening at my foot when I'm running? Yeah. Uh, you know, don't have the, the strength and the capacity to safely take that load. Um, and then the other component is... Um, so that comes under our strength. So can we actually then do repeated heel raises with extra load just to build up that strength uh, in those muscles? So the same as normal strength training. And then the other thing about the Achilles um, rehab and Achilles training is exactly what we started our call with, which is plyometrics, skipping, jumping. Um, have you got the spring and the snap uh, in, and reactivity um, in your in your tissue, so what we call that rate of force development. Um, so that's often a, an overlooked part of people's rehab. Um, 
most people are familiar with doing you know the heel raises on the stairs uh, the classic is the Alfredson protocol which is three by 15 repetitions um, and doing that uh, well the original one is three times a day but twice a day does work as well um, but there's more to it than that um, there's the ideas around using the static the isometrics whether it's getting very heavy weight and doing very slowly lowering the heels or even very slowly coming up on the tiptoes um, so there's been various studies looking at what is the best way to fix an Achilles and the short answer is there isn't one way to do it so the trick is knowing knowing your particular needs or from our point of view as, as physios as sports medicine uh, professionals is knowing who it is in front of us and what their particular deficits are and what they're there for their needs are so for some people it will be doing the endurance work the you know the classic three by 15s for some people it'll be doing the plyometrics for some people will be doing heavy heavy loaded um heel raises or holds or a combination of all of it I think um, I like the combination of all of it and yeah. and it seems to me like um, strengthening the Achilles um, is leads quite nicely on to the next question which is about the ankle strength does it not because some of the exercises that you've been talking about I just I've just been thinking about the ankle strength so um, so Jasper Kiernan was asking um, he sprained his ankle about seven weeks ago and it feels fine when he runs on the road but on rough trails it still feels a bit weak and occasionally gives him some pain so he yeah. was just wondering what exercises you recommend to increase the ankle strength and prevent future injury and I've taken yeah. some screenshots and things from your Instagram and there's a, vi a video uh, on Instagram as well that I can play to everyone just yeah, whenever sure. you whenever you are whenever you need it yeah um, so what we know with ankle sprains is you're a greater risk of going over it again um, so if you've done it once you're more likely to do it again yeah I did it it's once like really painfully again. and then I went over it on again like three times and it, oh my goodness it hurts so much especially the future times because oh, it was yeah, I kept going and it's still not the same it's that left one the one I can't do the calf raises with so yeah so, I, I hear your pain Jasper <laughs> yeah, to get you stronger aren't we so what we know is you are going to be at a greater risk for anything up to sort of nine months some studies have even shown longer than that um, and there's various reasons for that most of those are to do with the kind of nerve control the neural control around the ankle um, some of it can be muscle weakness because maybe um, you had some injuries to the, the muscles down the side of the shin um, and so there may be some time to re-strengthen those but a lot of it is coming down to your brain's awareness of what's happening around your foot and your ankle and being able to react to the position that it's in so the sense of where that foot is in so what often happens is you lose that awareness so you know the ankle's starting to go and your brain doesn't quite realize quick enough before it's too late so your rehab has to incorporate a lot of balance work posh word for that is proprioception that awareness of where your body is in space so the very simple thing and i get all my athletes to do it anyway is brush your teeth on one leg so you can be doing your exercises twice a day you can have clean teeth and strong ankles keep your dentist and your physio happy <laughs> um, or get in the habit of you know when you're making a brew um, stand on one leg whatever kind of trigger is going to remind you to practice doing your balance exercises work on that um, you can add in um, unstable surfaces so things like a wobble cushion or balance cushion uh, or a wobble board and stand on that to give yourself a little bit more of a dynamic uh, movement to the, the the body and the and the brain how to respond to the foot kind of moving if you haven't got things like that and uh, it's difficult to get hold of fitness equipment these days everyone's sold out haven't they <laughs> or a pillow just get a normal pillow fold it over stand on that it's a bit soft it's a bit squidgy and your muscles are just going to have to work a little bit harder and then it's appreciating what systems do we use to balance well, we use the nerves that are coming from our tendons, our ligaments, our joints, telling the brain what's happening in the joint. We use the circular canals in our ears 
and we use our eyesight to know where we are in space. So I'm sure we've all done the, the games of standing on one leg, close your eyes, try not to fall over, and most of us then fall over. Claire, we could get you to demonstrate, couldn't we? Oh, Maybe. yes, yes we could, although I can't, I, I've got headphones in, so <laughs> I, I'm attached to the computer, so if I fall over it's all going to just go really wrong. So um, standing on your right leg, your good leg, Yeah. you can close your eyes. Here we go, guys. We're going to have some fun with Claire now. Uh-oh. But I can't... I'll, oh, if I pull this out, it's going to start background. echoing. This may not work because you blur the background, Claire. Oh. <laughs> I could unblur the background. Okay. So you can see she's having to work a little bit harder now. She's got her eyes closed because her brain isn't getting yeah, that information. Yeah, I'm good with that leg. I'm, I'm quite good with that leg. Yeah, so let's see what your left leg, your injured leg is like. Yeah, that's not as good. Yeah, we know what's going to happen now. Not as good this leg. So immediately she's having to move her arms and legs around to try and stabilise a bit harder. She's trying. Not too bad. That, that was quite a valiant effort, I thought. How long am I supposed to do that for? So, again, you should be able to do that for... Sorry, have a seat, Claire, you're fine. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, you should be able to do that for at least 30 seconds, if not a minute or, or even longer. Um, so add that in as a bit of a game, a bit of a, a challenge for you to, to build into it. Um, but we could see there that you were having to move your arms and your leg more to, to stabilize. You're working harder to, to find that balance on that left leg. So we can take the eyesight out of the equation. The other thing we can do is as we're standing is actually just move your head from side to side. So you're just messing with the, the circular canals in your ears. Uh -huh. So again, can you balance and, and do that? Ah. Um, but there's some, some sound counter arguments to that in that when we're running, we don't run with the eyes closed. So how useful is that really in training? And it's, it's a fair counter argument, really. So the other thing to do is actually get yourself on uneven ground. So, you know, find some, whether it's on the, on the hills, on the trails, um, you know, a camber. And what's it like if you actually stand with your foot on a, a slight camber? Can you balance like that? The same if your foot's turning in, can you balance like that? What's it like with your toes pointing down? How well are you balancing that way? So just stress your foot and ankle in all sorts of different directions rather than just practicing our balancing with your foot flat on the ground. Ah, that's good. Or like on the grass. I sometimes do it outside on the grass in my house, like try and do yoga. Um, yeah. and it's quite funny on the live chat, people are trying to do the calf raises right now. So they're all like, they're all writing out how many they can okay. do. <laughs> so yeah. I'll just read a couple to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, Antonio Cardinelli says, um, very interesting indeed for runners. Um, Kurt Steed says his physio has been getting him to do 15 of the whole calf raise things. Um, and uh, Nigel says, very interesting explanation about the Achilles strengthening exercises. So thanks, Tim. Um, this is awesome. Um, then Guy says, I have just done 35 single leg calf raises. I just had to test myself. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Like he's almost elite there, I thought. Yeah. Um, uh, Rich Simpson said, "Yeah, it's a good exercise." Um, Nigel's just done it too, and he's got he's got thirty. He said, "Not bad for fifty-seven years old." I think that's brilliant, Nigel. That's very good. good. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's above. You're above average, sir. Well yeah. Done. And then um, John, I think he's joking, but he's just written that he's done it for two hours. <laughs> Don't I don't think you have. <laughs> John Gardner that I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Nigel says also he was given the eyes closed exercise for a broken ankle years ago and it was very effective. So obviously that's why he's so good at the calf raises as well. He does his exercises. Good stuff. Um, so they're kind of moving on from that. And I think I did um, send you a, a video for this one. The yeah. kind of, well, they're like six way ankle walk. So it's again part of the kind of ankle strength skill coordination type exercises so walk you know practice walking forward on your tiptoes practice walking on your heels practice walking on the outside edge of your foot walking on the inside edge of your foot and then walking with your toes turned out your toes turned in in other words training your feet to be in all sorts of different directions angles positions so that when you're out on the trails 
if your foot lands in a certain way, you can react to it. Whereas if you only ever practice on the flat, and then you go and run on the trails, that's where you're going to get the problems coming in. Um, but maybe just taking it back a level in that um, if you've got an acute injury, so a recent sprained ankle, it's probably worth looking at if you are going to be out on the on the trails, on the on the mountains, things like that. Um, is using maybe an ankle brace or some strapping, just to give it that little bit of extra support. Now, again, the research is a bit mixed as to why that works, how it works, how long it works for. Um, generally, the research seems to show that it loses its mechanical effect after about 20 minutes. And yet, most of us are out there for more than 20 minutes. Mm. But we also see that it does actually still have an effect for longer than that, even though the mechanical effect is lost, essentially because the um, the adhesive has started to, to loosen off and um, the materials are starting to stretch. Um, so some of that is literally just that feeling of kind of gripping around the ankle. Your brain picks that up and it's just a bit more aware of what's going on at your ankle. Um, so, I mean, I've got my, my left ankle, well, my whole body's a bit of a mess. Um, I'm, I'm full of metal, but my left ankle, I've got very little left in the way of, of some of the ligaments. Um, so in training, I generally I'm okay. But if I'm racing and I'm pushing it hard and I'm taking those risks, then I will take my ankles off. Mm, yeah. And I would for you know ultra marathons that are taking you know maybe 20 hours, and that tape is still giving me a little bit of it's going to be a little bit of psychological support. Um, but hey, placebos work even when you know it's a placebo. Yeah, they really do, and it, it does make you feel nice having that nice yeah. um, the K tape around your foot and your ankle. It's like ping, it like pings you, doesn't it? So, and is it mechanically doing anything? No, probably not. <laughs> is it psychological? Yeah, probably. Um, but if it is only psychological, if it is only a placebo, and it works for you, then okay. go for it. And yeah. do you mind explaining to everybody why you're full of metal? Is it is it okay to talk about um, your car accident? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I had a car crash coming up 20 years ago. So when I was depressingly 20, I'm nearly 40. Um, so yeah, I had a car crash then. Um, got hit head on by a, a BMW on the wrong side of the road. I was in a Peugeot 106. So you can imagine who walked away and who didn't. Um, so yeah, I, I broke both legs, pelvis, ribs, arm, jaw, um, lungs, you name it. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of life support for a couple of weeks, uh, wheelchair for about six months, um, told I was, uh, well, told I'd never run again. Um, and that was partly true uh, because of the way they had to rapidly put me back together again because I was dying on the operating table first time round. Um, but then a couple, about 18 months after that, um, I opted to have my right femur re-broken uh, and repositioned oh. in order to get my hip in a better alignment again. Uh, and that got me running again. Um, oh. And I'm still sort of not really supposed to get back to ever being able to run again. Um, but I proved them wrong. Brilliant. So, That's yeah. fantastic. And you do triathlons now, don't you, as well, even? And lots of cycling. I don't call myself a triathlete anymore. My last triathlon was 2017. Um, oh, it's only two years ago. Yeah, no, so my, my rehab was, you know, hydrotherapy, uh, which turned into doing a bit of swimming. I then got an exercise bike, so I then bought a bike and started cycling. Uh, and a couple of years later, uh, I started running again, and I can still clearly see and feel that emotion of being able to run for 30 seconds on the treadmill. Wow. Um, um, and then, yeah, just slowly building it back up from there. So that turned into, I was a runner before. Um, so that turned into doing triathlon and I worked my way up and I did several Ironman and um, and did so reasonably reasonably well as an age grouper there. Or not quite breaking the 10 hours. I think 10.06 was my, my PB. Wow, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's yeah, so, went, so good from coming from everything broken in a car accident, not even sure. Like, you must have not been even sure. Like, people must have thought maybe he won't even survive and then to oh, really? fully yeah. survive intensive care come out and just fully rehab yourself and you must have done your exercises really diligently like we'll all do here today after speaking to you <laughs> I say it just proves anything's possible I mean I've gone I've taken my marathon time down to just under the three hour marks now uh, so it's a 258 
uh, my 100k um, down to sort of 843. So I won Race to the Stones last year. Wow. So, you know, it, it can be done. It's just, it's hard work. Yeah. Are you sure they didn't put some extra stuff in you when they put you back together? Definitely <laughs> bit not. Of a, a bit of an engine. Definitely <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah. Oh, well, you must have done all your exercises perfectly, um, which leads me on to our next question because we're going up the body here. Um, we've yep. done Achilles, we've done, well, we've done barefoot skipping, we've done Achilles, we've done ankles, and now yep. we're on to knees before we go on to hips, before we go on to glutes, and then okay. and then I'll try, I'll see if we've got any time to answer any questions on the live chat, but I'm okay. prioritizing these ones because they're from yeah. patrons and they have been sent in ahead of time. So we have okay. got a question from Seb. Um, who is after some knee exercises um, oh. because his kneecaps uh, keep complaining towards the end of a long run. Um, okay. I don't know if he's watching right now, but maybe he needs to tell us what distance a long run is because it could be different for every, everyone. But I'm thinking like, I don't know, two or three hours, maybe even the marathon kind of, maybe four it's hours. Really matter. Um, it doesn't really matter what, what that long okay. run is. It's, it's all relative really, mm -hmm. so a long run for that particular person. Yeah. Um, so if you, you say sort of kneecaps, we're talking sort of front of the, the knee type pain and there's there's different um, structures and therefore different specifics of what that injury might be. Um, but there's some general themes and this kind of fits in, I think one of the other questions you mentioned about coming up was kind of hip strength and glute strengthening, things like that. Yeah. And these kind of, the themes kind of follows, you know, what is the best exercise to do? There is no one best exercise. The best exercise is the one that you do consistently. Yeah. That, that's what's going to work for you. Um, because there's a million and one exercises you could pick. Um, but when we think about sort of maybe that knee pain towards the end of a long run, the, the common things are the running technique itself. So sometimes it's not actually um, a particular weakness in the in the muscles is maybe how you're running. So the common problems we see is to do with cadence, and that links back to maybe a little bit at the very beginning of our conversation regarding the rhythm and timing. So if you are running, so if it's coming on towards the end of a long run, you start to get a little bit tired. Um, your cadence, so that that t step turnover, stride rate, is slowing down a little bit. Um, what happens is we get an increase in force going through things like the knee and the hip. So when you're running quicker with a faster turnover, you are not in contact with the ground for as long. So there's less chance for that ground sort of spike of force that goes up through the body to travel up to your knees and your hips. The longer you're in contact with the ground, the more your knees and hips take the load. So of course, conversely, the less time you're in contact with the ground, the more your foot and your Achilles take the load. So again, this is doing a bit of a 360 back to our earlier conversation. <laughs> so if you're starting to get a little bit of knee pain as you're running, then ask yourself, or maybe you know your watch might have cadence. How quick is your is your step rate? And what we know is anything less than about 170 steps a minute has an increased risk of all lower limb running related injuries mm. um, what is your optimum cadence you need to explore with that and see what it's going to be like but what, this, what a, all the research has shown is if you find out your natural cadence so let's say you naturally run at about 160 165 we'll try and increase that by most studies are coming up at 10 percent some have shown some improvements at eight percent but go for 10 percent increase that cadence by 10 percent and the chances are your knee's going to feel a lot better. So it's thinking about are you going from maybe a bit of a midfoot strike when you're running nice and fresh, but as you get tired, you get a bit more of a heel strike. Heel striking is not a problem, but it does mean that your knee takes more of the load. So is it that your cadence is going down, your heel striking a little bit more, you're getting a bit more tired? The other thing we often see is with the running technique is. Uh, the, the technical term is contralateral pelvic drop. So your pelvis, the opposite side. So if I'm standing on the leg which has got my watch on here, 
uh, get my left and right mixed up because you're going to be in mirror turn, mirror reversal here. But if I'm landing on this leg here, and if the hips then drop on the other side, that pull over the side of the hip here, so this fits in a little bit with one of your later questions around the bursa, I'm trying to, trying to jump on, join our questions together. Um, if we're dropping that hip down, then again, what we're also going to be seeing is a bit of a, probably a twist of that thigh and therefore a twist of that knee. So we're now going to get that kneecap getting maybe pulled in a slightly awkward position. And that may well then also lead to some of that knee pain. So the first things I'll be getting, um, somebody saying they're getting knee pain at the, uh, the front of their knees towards the end of a long run, is I'll get them checking their cadence. So is it still above 170? So when you're running along, count your left, uh, every time your left foot hits the ground over 15 seconds and times that by four, that's the easy way to do it. Uh, or a lot of watches these days uh, also pick up your cadence, uh, usually through the heart rate strap. Um, so maybe check whether your watch is giving you those running metrics. Um, or again, it might be looking at your data after your run and, and seeing whether you can analyze your cadence that way. But the simple thing is just count your left foot strike every 15 seconds, times that by four, and is that number above 170? If it's not, lift it up a little bit. Um, other tricks are download your metronome, plug it into your ears, and just run to the beat. It gets a bit boring, but it does the job. Um, or you can find music with a certain beats per minute and just run at that sort of beat per minute and it just gets you into that rhythm. Get that drilled into your head, learn this new rhythm, and then you can take it into your everyday running. So yeah, cadence, are, are you starting to land quite heavy on your heels? So do we need to, again, get a bit lighter through your feet? So cadence, light on your feet. Try and be a ninja, not big, heavy, slap, slap, slap. Um, and the other thing is just think about running tall. So just by lifting yourself tall, generally starts to get you to engage your, your core muscles, engage your hips, which then also stops this drop of your pelvis. So again, stabilizes your leg, your knee. So again, that just starts to do it, the whole kind of, yeah, pull yourself up by the back of your head. Hmm. So just think, quick, light, tall. Brilliant, quick, light, tall, quick, light, tall. They should make uh, something at, they should make a song at 170 beats per minute called quick light and tall like quick like tall quick like tall like yeah, there could be some I'm rapping. sure one of your listeners has got more musical skills than, uh, <laughs> than i have yeah so need someone to someone needs to make that yeah. <laughs> cool that's right. fantastic so that's the kind of and then uh, i suppose the other things is looking at um have the the thigh muscles the quads got a little bit too tight um are you spending too much time sat down uh, and i think that's a challenge for a lot of us at the moment where maybe we're only getting out of the house you know, once a day, we're not walking to meetings, we're not walking to work, um, maybe spending more time sat at the computers. So our, our hips and our thighs getting a little bit too tight. We just need to even include a little bit more yoga and sort of follow on with some of your yoga in the garden videos. Um, maybe just need to jump on the foam roller just to relax those muscles before you go for a run in order to, um, like I say, release any of that tension. So it might be before you go for that run, do a quick MOT. How are my hips feeling? How are my thighs feeling? How are my knees feeling? How loose are my ankles? Everything's good? Great, off I go. Or, oh, yeah, hips are a bit stiff. I've been sat down a long time. But rather than trying to run yourself into it, just spend five, ten minutes rolling around on the floor, doing some of Claire's yoga, um, <laughs> and then uh, maybe jump on a foam roller. Exactly. <laughs> get your chi centered and then you can go for your run and you're going to run much better and you're not going to finish your run with with that knee pain so you're going to finish with a smile on your face yeah with pizzazz exactly <laughs> brilliant yeah. that's fantastic uh, so that, have i covered obviously i'm going off on tangents <laughs> no huge? that's yeah. brilliant i'm just aware of the time because i told you that it'd take 45 minutes and here we are at 55 I'm minutes so um, i did walk you that i would go off on tangents <laughs> Yeah, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, uh, we we have got two more questions. If you have got time from, I've got uh, time if you want to keep going. Yeah, sure. that would sure. that would be amazing. Um, there's the one about the hip bursts, and then there's mm. there's a final one about glute strength. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's there has been some questions on the live chat as well, but I just don't think we'll get time for them tonight, unfortunately. 
Um, but yeah, just a quick okay. one about the hip bursts. I'll go, th I'll go through those. Um, yeah, if you get through them quick, then we can get to some more questions. And then, um, just like also, in, a yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah. In a nutshell. So this guy, Stuart, he has a burst on his hip after a mountain bike accident, flares up during long runs. What can I do to stop it flaring up whilst out running? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so this is um, a long standing, I'm, I'm assuming, after this mountain bike accident. Um, it comes back to what we've just been talking about regarding the, the pelvis and being stable at the pelvis. So if, again, we come back to my little sort of diagram here, that as you're landing, I'll get my hands right around, if you're landing on the, the leg with my watch on um, and the hips are dropping down, so we don't have the strength on this the standing leg, as it were, to keep the pelvis up, um, then what's going to be happening is you're going to have a huge amount of tension and pressure so if you imagine that bony bit at the side of your hips, if you kind of stand up and feel the bony bits there, you can almost imagine that's what my watch is like there. So I've got the muscle over the top, and that's now getting pulled into here because the pelvis is dropping down. There's a lot of tension to stop your, your pelvis dropping. So that's probably what's then causing the bursitis or the inflammation of that bursa. Um, because the bursa is um, it's like a washer, it's a fluid-filled sac that sits between tissues or between bone and, and tissues. Um, and that swelling is an irritation is going to be because of repeated squashing and, and um, there might be some old scarring around that bursa as well, which maybe uh, predisposes it to being irritated um, from the, the running. So the solution is going to be get super strong and stable at those hips. So a lot of glute strength, uh, a lot of core strength, a lot of awareness of keeping that pelvis level. So if you think about your pelvis like a bucket of water, you don't want to be sloshing that bucket around all the time. You want to try and keep it fairly stable. So the old thing of not sticking your bum out and pouring water out the front of it, um, or not going the other way and tilting backwards, trying to tuck your bum under too much, but it's also not about tilting it side to side. So can you keep it level? Some exercises you can do, let's go back to our stairs again stand on one bottom step of the stairs but now sort of 90 degrees on so you've got one leg on one leg off to the side drop that hip down and then hitch that hip back up again so you're just doing this to train yourself to no stay up tall don't drop it down stay up tall yeah um so that'd be one simple exercise to do the other ones come back to our running technique cues so keeping that quick cadence if you're not in contact with the ground, if you're in contact with the ground for a long time, you've got more time to drop the hip. If you're not in contact with the ground for very, very long, you haven't got the you haven't got the time to drop the hip, so you're not going to get the tension. Same with the cadence, quick cadence. The ankle and Achilles is going to take more of the load. Slow cadence, again, the hip's going to take more of that load. So think about being light on your feet, quick cadence, run tall running tall, engage the core, pelvis doesn't drop quite so much. Fantastic. Um, and then, yeah, other things are just going to be work on things like your planks, your side planks. Can you do a side plank on one leg? Um, there's other sort of core tests you can do. There's one called the bunky test. Um, Claire, if you do a search on my YouTube page, there is a, uh, a video demonstrating the, the bunky test. Um, so that's just doing a, a front plank, a side plank, reverse plank uh, and the one that runners never do which is the adductor one so that's working the inner thigh um, and strengthening the inner thigh so you know how balanced are you with all of those so you know the classic exercises are going to be your bridges so lying on your back lifting your bum up in the air um, or hip thruster so weight on your hips and again lifting your hips up in the air um, our side planks um, side clams maybe um, adding in some resistance there with some exercise bands um, or the other one is like sort of crab walks or monster walks where you've got a band around your knees and you're stepping sideways to again strengthen those muscles at the side of the hips but there's loads you can do it's probably just picking a couple of those key exercises that you can build into your training um, again I was just thinking what you could copy um, and share with with him is um, again if you go on my my YouTube one there's a video called the Myrtle routine which is a good general hip strength um, routine mobilization routine to do before you go for a run um, 
there's an, there's another one I think on their sort of general sort of glute and hip mobilization pre-run so there's a few things on there uh, maybe follow a bit of a routine and if you just do that consistently then it'll start to build up and it will start to strengthen um, so is that maybe combined those two questions yeah yeah that sounds really good and um so was that combining the glute exercises as well yeah yeah because the, yeah. the two go hand in hand so it's all the, the hip bursa mm -hmm. it's about having sufficient glute strength um there may be some tightness you know muscle tightness stiffness um issues that also might need to be addressed um so that might involve some stretching might involve some um, foam rolling or you know rolling around with a tennis ball uh, on the floor sitting on that um, but often what we've got to address first is the strength and the running technique so those kind of three key cues um, to focus on so I'd work with those first and then we might need to explore other areas yeah that sounds okay. great and um there are a couple of questions from patrons that i yep. know that are on the live chat so i just um i just i, I give priority to patrons because they're the people who support me um, yeah, yeah. um every month so um i'll just read one out so this is guy greater x he says um can you ask about upper body twisting because this happens to me um so yeah do you need to reduce that like or is it is it a problem or should he work to reduce that body twisting so finding that as, as you're running, the, the upper body is twisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So we do want to be trying to keep everything relatively stable um, in that upper body um, for essentially economic reasons. It's wasted energy that the, the, the body's um, twisting around. And as you're running, the, the pelvis is, is obviously twisting along with the legs. But if the upper body is staying stable and you've got good strength and, and so your core musculature um, and use of the arms, you'll get an elastic recoil coming from the upper body trying to stay stable and the, and the hips moving, which will give you a bit more spring uh, and therefore running efficiency coming out the, the lower legs. Um, but if your upper body is twisting, then you're just, you're just bleeding energy, essentially. Ah, okay. So it is good to reduce it. You want to try and reduce it. So there are some simple exercises to work on that sort of anti-rotation. Um, things like the, it gets called bird dog or Superman. Oh, yeah. So that's the one on your hands and knees and you try and lift one arm or, and then the opposite leg and don't twist and wobble. Um, so you might, have, I don't know if you demonstrated that in any of your yoga videos, Claire, but um, I've got some, uh, some demos on, on my YouTube channel for that. Um, other ones being things like what's called the Paloff Press. So if you've got some elastic bands, you could tie that onto um, a solid object, whether it's a door handle or banister or something like that, out to your side. You then hold onto it and you pull that elastic band into the middle and you try and resist that pull of the band trying to twist you and you've got to keep that, that body still. So it's training the things like your oblique muscles to stabilize that upper body and minimize that twist. Mm. And then the so it's coming back to what are you doing with your arms? So if, if your arms are swinging all over the place, then you, your body's going to move with them. So trying to keep those arms maybe swinging a little bit more sort of relaxed, but you know, forwards rather than maybe swinging side to side. Again, the research regarding how important the arm swing is, is a bit mixed. Uh, most of it shows that the arms don't really contribute a huge amount, um, but that's, I think I feel that's more a misinterpretation of the data. So um, we've shown that you know if you just strap your arms by your side, literally strap them down and try like and run. Like an Irish dancer. Yeah, like an Irish dancer. Um, there's some studies that have said it's only about four percent harder to run. Really? But four percent of you know, a long distance, it soon starts to add up, and yeah, so I don't quite get that one. I think it's uh, way more than four percent. I think it's. Yeah. I think it's four. It's it's ninety six percent harder. I would I think say they've so. got that the wrong way around. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Um, but a lot of kind of old, you know, track coaches would give you lots of you know arm swing drills, and it's got to be a certain way. Um, generally speaking, I would just say whatever's going to be a comfortable, relaxed swing, so whether it's a bit of a straighter arm, whether it's a bit more bend, you know, you're Michael Johnson with your arms up like this. If it works for you, great. That's what 
that's what matters. But trying to make sure that you know upper body is relatively stable and you're not wasting energy by swinging side to side, leaning right forward, things like that. Um, so, have you? Is that a- yeah, question. I'm just wondering, have you got YouTube open um, but muted? Because I have got a film of Guy running. So if I put this up on my screen, if you've still got YouTube up, then you could watch it and just... Because uh, I've I've watched it and I, if you just mute it... but, yeah, mute but it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to put the video of Guy on just now. Um, it will be a bit delayed. Um, okay. But basically, this is Guy coming out of the forest and he's going to... He's just running... Oh, hang on. Here we go. It's in slow motion, but I don't think his body twists that much. Like, I don't know what you can tell from that, but... I haven't quite caught up with the delay yet. Yeah, but his body doesn't look like it's twisting that much to me. So, it would be interesting to know what you think. Okay, right, I've now got the um, the videos just come up by the trees. Yeah. So. That left shoulder's not coming forward quite as much, is it? Well, it looks like it. Yeah, he doesn't look. It doesn't look like he's doing this or anything. But no, um, it does look like the the left shoulder's not coming forward quite as much. Um, so I just get my own face out of the picture. That's quite off-putting. <laughs> uh, and just realising I've, I've got the, the sun setting just over there, so I, I can see my, my face is half, half in. Half and half, yeah. Mine, mine is similar because yeah. I've got a window over there. But I have got a light as well, so I that's could, helping. I could try and swing it around. We're nearly done, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. good, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, didn't, it looked like, yeah, maybe a little bit twisted. So the, the question is, you know, is that coming from the shoulders? Um, is that coming from the body or is that maybe coming from the hips and is there something is there more of a stiffness in one hip is he lacking a bit of the hip extension uh, on one side I couldn't quite see that in in that little clip there Um, so that's probably the sort of things to explore on that front is is it really down to the upper body or is there something else going on Um, you know unfortunately the head bones connected to neck bone neck bone backbone backbone hip bone it's all interconnected well, you're in Manchester, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So Very Guy cool. is in um, oh, what's that place that's really near to Manchester? Um, st- it begins with a, an S. Um, uh, he he lives really near Macclesfield Forest. Okay. Um, yeah. So Guy lives there. So maybe when this is all yeah. over, you and Guy can hook up and he can book yeah, a session yeah. with you. Yeah. 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 I was been get one getting sorted or getting in one of the team. We got um, the the physio clinic has got a lot of uh, very very good running physios. Uh, we do some running service there and uh, running researchers as well. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a university lecturer, so uh, a lot of the uh, the people at the clinic are also university staff and researchers uh, in running mechanics and, and lead that one. So yeah, we've got a good team to to call upon. So if it's not with me, it could be with one of the team. Um, we'll, we'll between us we'll we'll get him sorted. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I've just put your web address below as well. Um, have we got time for you to just answer one last question from yeah. a patron, which is live? Um, it's Arlene M, and she says, "Last July, I fractured the fifth metatarsal in my left foot while rolling my ankle on a trail. It healed in about four weeks. Is it better to break a bone or sprain a tendon in your ankle?" Whoa. Um, the kind of old wives tale as it were is it's it's quicker to heal a broken bone than it is a, a ligament and there's some truth in that but what you've got to remember is the forces required to break the bone will have also done soft tissue damage you don't only break the bone um and four weeks is you know that's pretty quick i mean basically bones take um well arguably 12 months plus um, you see most of the healing happen within the first six weeks uh, and then the bulk of it's done in, the, in the, the next kind of up to three months or so but you're seeing continual remodeling of the of the bony tissue for 12 months plus um, but it comes back to again you know she obviously went over on the ankle in such a way that then it wasn't the ligament that went it was the bone that couldn't take that force um, which comes back to our very earlier conversations regarding kind of tissue capacity. 
Um, you know, can you land on the outside of your ankle and not break it and not sprain it? Yes, if you've got the muscle and ligament strength and the bone strength to take it. Um, if you haven't, something's going to break. Um, so, is it is it better to break the bone or, or the ligaments? You could argue it either way, really. But um, yeah, from a from a pure healing point of view, probably the bone. But um, it's rare that it's only the bone that's the problem. Um, and it still comes back to you've got to work on all those principles that we talked about earlier on regarding strength and balance and stability. That's really interesting. And yeah, so it just kind of shows that the old wife tale isn't that isn't that good because you've probably it's broken not, a few things. Yeah, it's not wrong, but there's more to it than that. Yes, yeah. So everything's, everything's kind of just... Yeah, there's a bit more to that. It's not quite as simple, um, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. Well, um, well, yeah, thank you so much for answering all of these questions, plus two extra bonus questions at the end there. Um, and sorry to anybody who didn't get the question answered via the live chat from the lovely Tim here tonight. Um, I did have to prioritise all the patron questions, so I think I've got them all answered. Um, so if there's any other ones, you, you know, maybe... If you want to do a, a written Q and A on your Facebook page or something, we can always do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. Like whenever you're up for doing another one, that'd be great. And also, these we we did a lot of injury kind of physio type questions, and yeah. I don't think a lot of people also sort of cottoned on to the fact that you're an endurance coach as well. So um, there was some questions on the live about that. So I know that it is an area that uh, that people are interested in, like endurance coaching, going up to doing ultras and stuff like that. So maybe a bit later in the year, we could do like an yeah. ultra running endurance based one as well. Absolutely. Yeah, no problems at all. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I just want to read you out some nice things that people have said about you before we say goodbye tonight. Um, I hate them to dial in. <laughs> yeah yeah so your wife has dialed in and said um no it, it's um oh hang on no, there she's was... out in the garden over there <laughs> yeah um so oh no everyone's having a great chat about the plank here um john airy said that when guy was running across there he just looked like the bionic man <laughs> so that was that's funny um uh oh there was some somebody said he oh yes here we go so kev jh said i think I, he came in a bit later and he said i think i'll have to watch this one from the start it sounds very interesting and informative so there we go um colin thompson has never joined a live chat session before but he says this has been genuinely useful interesting and enjoyable thanks so thank you colin for joining um so um Colin has also just bought some K-tape on Amazon as well. Um, uh, and Sebastian says he loves the plank exercises that you recommended um, and he loves them. There's so many variants to choose from. Um, Guy says, thanks so much for fitting my question. Very much appreciated. Um, and um, uh, Genevieve says, thanks so much, Tim. So interesting. Arlene M says, thanks for answering as well. Um, Guy says, great advice. Oh, there's loads of people. John says, thanks you very, very much, Tim. Leon Young said, really useful tonight. Thanks. Alex said, fabulous talk. It's good to see things linked together in a systematic way. John Gardner, thanks very much. Interesting conversation. Chloe, thanks, Tim and Claire. Nigel, thanks for the great advice. Jasper, thanks, Tim and Claire. Excellent tips on ankle strength and balance. And Seb says, great session tonight. Thanks so much. So yes. there you go. And do you know what? There was there was 50 people watching live at the zenith point, like right in the middle. Like it yeah. goes up and up and up and up as more and more people realize it's on YouTube. Um, so yeah, this uh, looks like it's going to be a, a super popular episode. Excellent. So I hope yeah. it brings you in some new clients, um, especially anybody who's yeah. around the Manchester area. And actually, you don't need to be in Manchester, do you? You can have coaching wherever you are in the world. Yeah, I mean, sort of the coaching side of things, you know, it's all online. I've got athletes all over the world, um, you know, as far away as Japan. Um, wow. And from a, um, um, a physio consult point of view, obviously, we're all working online these days. So we're doing um, consults via Zoom. Um, so, yeah, if anybody does want to sort of talk to me or any other um, members of uh, the team uh, at the clinic, then, yeah, get in touch and I can, I can put you in touch with um the the clinic and we can sort something out um if needs be or you know just yeah um catch me on sort of doing most of my work stuff on instagram these days you know drop me a line on there 
my, I know you've done a, a link to my website. I'm redoing my website at the moment. It's, uh, the current one is horribly out of date. But yeah, there is, there is some. <laughs> Mine uh, is too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I saw you were asking about um, yeah. people to help your website. I'm, I'm on exactly the same project in this uh, lockdown period. I think a lot of us are, aren't we? Yeah, it's just like, like right, like now we've got some time to think where we're not yeah. going to events all the time, then what can we do? Yeah. But yeah. I've put um, I've put your, um, your uh, just under your head here on the screen, you, you'll probably be able to see that it says your website address for okay. your company. Um, and also it'll be in a link in the description below. So you can just click straight through on that as well. Cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, so thank you everybody for sending your questions in. Um, and if I'm sorry if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, but if you do want to make sure that I guarantee to ask your question to our experts on these live chats, then um, support me on patreon.com slash wild ginger running and um, I can make sure that your question gets asked, especially if you pre-ask it when I post about it. So thanks to everybody who's written a question to Tim here tonight. And thank you for joining us, Tim, and for spending spending so long with us tonight it's just been really really lovely of you um and i hope that we can do it again soon cheers thanks very much cool okay night everyone and bye tim <laughs> cheers